Hi, this is your host Abdul Bharti and we are here at KubeCon EU in Amsterdam and today we have with us once again Gabriele Colombo, General Manager of LF Europe. Gabriele, first of all, it's great to have you back on the show. Nice to see you again. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and last time when we talked was when the, the you know, the LF Europe was launched, a couple, couple of other projects were launched, yep. and we were talking, you were talking about, hey, these are very early days, you know, so in a few you know, months we'll have better picture. So let's get that better, better picture now. Okay. Um, yeah, it's been a pretty, pretty interesting six months, let's say. Um, uh, as you know, I still sort of divide my life between Linux Foundation Europe and, and I still am the executive director of Finos, our, our FinTech Open Source Foundation. But as far as Europe goes, it has been uh, you know, six months of, of growth. Uh, we have just passed uh, 100 members uh, in, in uh, Linux Foundation Europe, uh, which I think is a really great sign of, of you know, uh, fit for the European market and the need for an open source foundation. Uh, like us, sort of on a global scale. Uh, we've launched two projects. Um, Silva is the first one that we launched in December. Uh, it's a really, really promising uh, uh, cloud collaboration across the largest telco vendors in Europe. I think a great example of the type of sort of vertical projects that, that we see, uh, you know, uh, uh, as a good archetype of projects for, for European collaboration. Uh, you know, given the, the strength of, of many verticals uh, like Telco in, in Europe. Uh, and then Open Wallet Foundation, I think, again, the other really good example of more of a cross-industry horizontal project providing an engine for, uh, you know, a much more, uh, I would say, human-centric uh, wallet identity, very much aligned with the, you know, I EU pre priorities around uh, ADAS2, the, the European uh, ID. Uh, so I think two really good projects, um, and we have, you know, many more in the pipeline for the year. Um, what else? We've, uh, um, you know, I think one of the main learnings has been that the engagement of the public sector. I think we were talking about it in September. Uh, you know, it was, you know, hard hypothesis that that you need to engage much more the European sector, uh, sorry, the, the public sector in Europe, uh, and that has proven to be the case. We've been, uh, uh, you know, working much close, much more close in Brussels. We're following uh, the Cyber Resilience Act, uh, 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 as you know, and, and the potential concerns for the open source community. We have a call to action out there. Um, so all in all, it's been a very, very busy six months. Talking about Europe, uh, most of the open source, actually, the whole kernel also, the most developers here, culturally also Europe is more open source friendly uh, than, you know, off, it goes all the way back to our schooling and, you know, the, yes. the, the, the whole system which is available here. Yes. So when it comes to growing the membership, I think, what, what kind of, I mean, of course, you, you started, you know, in Europe. So what kind of stark contrast that you've seen here versus uh, states? You're absolutely right. Um, Europe has, I think, a stronger uh, grassroots uh, sort of open source culture. Um, oftentimes, to an extent, also uh, in stark contrast with the sort of corporate open source, if that makes sense. Um, I do believe, though, that uh, you know one of the success factors of the Linux Foundation Europe would be to really bring together these two souls of open source, if that makes sense. Uh, you know, ultimately, there's a lot of talk about sustainability of open source. And, uh, um, you know, without the large amount of corporate funding that has been poured into open source over the last, you know, two decades, uh, we would be probably in a much more dire place in terms of sustainability and security of our old supply chain. Um, so sure, there is a sort of a cultural difference in terms of what I call the, the romantic uh, aspect of open source that, that sort of as um, Europeans uh, we, we, we certainly believe in and that's where I sort of grew up uh, uh, in, in my early open source days. Uh, I think related to it, the second sort of major difference is that, you know, unsurprisingly, uh, a lot of the innovation and uh, sort of technology landscape in the US, it's driven, you know, out of the public, sorry, out of the private sector. You know, most of the, the innovation comes out of big tech or, you know, smaller startups, VC backed uh, type of organizations. Uh, I think in Europe, we see much less, you know, of course, as a, of a, of a 
you know, pure play technology companies, you know, SAP and a few others, GitLab, uh, um, you know, uh, Spotify, maybe are the three sort of big examples of technolo pure technology companies in Europe at sort of a large scale. Uh, and so I think instead, we'll see a lot of developments on uh, different verticals, you know, as verticals like telco, finance, healthcare, uh, um, automotive, they all undergo the digital transformation. They all understand that, you know, open source is a key pillar of any technology centric organization. And so I expect more of this, you know, silver like vertical type of collaborations. Um, and I think, again, the second aspect is the much stronger. Uh, you know, for good, in good and bad, but much stronger engagement of the public sector uh, coming down with regulations like the Cyber Resiliency Act, uh, the AI Act, the uh, Interoperability Act, even the DMA and DSA, Digital Markets Act and Digital Services Act. So basically, I see that the, the open source community need to be much more responsive and attentive to what's coming down in terms of regulation. And this is maybe kind of another sort of different aspect with, with respect to the US. The US is much more, again, private sector driven. So a lot of activities are going on from the public sector as well. Yes. Uh, but the point that you earlier made, which is really important, is that there are a lot of gross, gross movement going on. Uh, big companies, they may not be doing as much open source as they yeah. should. And then public sector, So, but it is all disjointed. Exactly. So I think that's where the Rural Linux Foundation is going to play, is to bring all these different parties together. Because yeah. they do love open source here. Yes. They do a lot of open source, but there is no framework where they can work together. There are a lot of organizations, there are a lot of, you know, but they're all kind of fragmented. So talk a bit about, you know, uh, once again, when we look at the next six months. Yes. So how are you planning to, to bring it, or does that question make sense? Oh, absolutely makes sense, almost like if we prepared it. Uh, uh, but um, yeah, we are active in many fronts in really providing uh, concrete uh, vehicles for collaboration of the public sector. Um, I would say it's primarily sort of in three areas. One is research. Um, we just published a fragmentation report that really talks about the role of open source and you know, a better collaboration even amongst open source foundations in fighting geopolitical fragmentation and really fighting also just the broader fragmentation in, in the open source community. And to your point, between the different constituencies, uh, there's no reason why the public sector and the private sector shouldn't be working together on an open source project. I'm seeing a lot of potential in that area. Uh, in finance, in, in sort of my, my other hat, if that makes sense. Um, so we will be putting out more publications and more uh, blueprints, really, to help the public sector um, not only better engage, but understand that it's not just about really consumption and procurement, but it's really about driving technology and social goals through open source. Uh, and so I think the Linux Foundation Europe is very uniquely positioned to almost expand that uh, very well balanced governance that we already have for private sector and individuals you know, to the public sector, a third main actor actively contributing to an open source project. Um, case in point, uh, Open Wallet Foundation is actually creating a government advisory council uh, very much, you know, I can style, um, and that's our first attempt to really create a clear body for the sort of public sector to at least advise, contribute, participate to the open source projects. Sort of early, uh, shifting left that engagement, if that makes sense. So definitely, research, uh, governance, and, and providing governance blueprints is something that we're actively working on. I think the third aspect is, is a much more. Um, mature uh, engagement with policymakers. Uh, not only, of course, through Linux Foundation Europe, we've been much more present, present in, in uh, Brussels. We've been present, you know, this week we're going to put out a call to action to you know, improve the Cyber Resiliency Act. As, as written, we definitely feel a responsibility uh, you know, as the largest shared technology investment in the world to really represent uh, the individual contributors that, that stand potentially at risk. Uh, with some of these regulations. Uh, that said, we also understand that, you know, from the standpoint of, of lawmakers, it's really hard to know who to talk to. You know, there's no, you know, when you're walking with a, with a you know, 
uh, with a proprietary product. Well, you go to a certain company, you talk to their public affairs departments, and you have a clear sort of interface and counterpart. The open source community, it's a pretty amorphous concept in the sense that who should they be talking to? And so um, we've done a couple of things in this area. We uh, just you know, uh, uh, undersigned a letter earlier in the week uh, with Eclipse and many other open source foundations, really trying to create a coalition uh, that can provide a really broad uh, representation of the open source community. You know, and offering lawmakers a, a, an ongoing dialogue, uh, if that makes sense. Uh, and secondly, uh, this is news, it's going to be announced in the next few days, uh, but we are uh, launching an open source congress. Uh, it's a conference that we're going to be hosting in uh, uh, July in Geneva. Uh, it is primarily to really build bridges across the different foundations and find you know, common areas of collaboration like policy, like open source sustainability, and hopefully that's going to be a key uh, venue to continue also this conversation with the public sector. What are the, some of the hurdles that you see when you engage? You know, you did talk about when you go to a proprietary vendor, you you have a throat to choke. You know, but when it comes to open source, you know, which vendor, which project, and there are so many vendors for the same project. So, what are some of the hurdles that you're seeing when you go and talk to either private sector, grassroots developers, or public sector? Where you're like, hey, these are the barriers. Yeah. So, I think you know, I'll start with the public sector. Um, I think, look, the, the the I reiterate the the sort of interface is certainly something that we're, that we're working on. You know, there, there's certainly a complexity from our side in representing the open source community. I mean, of course, the Linux Foundation is the largest uh, uh, foundation out there, so we certainly cover a big slice. Um, but, you know, uh, there's not a clear interface at this point. We don't do lobbying. We don't. Uh, you know, we're not a lobbying organization. We're actually working uh, very closely with Open Forum Europe, which are, uh, you know, it's, it's an open source uh, policy uh, think tank uh, based in Brussels, who really helped us also corral um, a lot of the responses to the CRA and, and other acts. So uh, we're certainly amping up sort of those relationships. But I think an element of investment in this area is going to be important. In fact, we have our senior community Senior Director of Community Development starting on June 1st. I can't share the name yet, but uh, he is going to come with a, a lot of experience in uh, EU policy, the economics of open source, and I think that's going to really help us have a more um, mature conversation with the lawmakers. Um, I think on the other side, um, there's an element of, um, I wouldn't say lack of understanding, but certainly uh, um, limited understanding of the complexity of the open source ecosystem and just broadly release how modern software development and release processes work. Uh, when you think about some of the potentially uh, um, negative impacts of the CRA, again, I want to be very clear, we're very supportive of acts like this that uh, try to bolster uh, um, you know, open source supply chain security and just generally software supply chain security. I mean, OpenSSF uh, is the most egregious example of, of the investment of DLF, the work that we've done with the White House, really corralling um, big tech vendors in a direct conversation with the White House really speaks volumes to it. Um, but, you know, when you think about the law, is how it's currently written, and, and there's I think a realization that, again, open source is not a unilateral, unidirectional value chain, you know, where you produce a piece of software, when you, you know, write a piece of software, then sell it, and then deliver value. There's a lot of intermedi intermediaries in the process, you know, foundations, package managers, code hosting like GitHub or GitLab. And I think to an extent, there is a little bit of a disconnect here in, in Brussels. Uh, where, look, open source on one hand is very much a pillar of the digital decade, the EU digital decade, and this idea of the digital commons, digital sovereignty, uh, um, human-centered next generation internet. So the EU at, at sort of senior level has a very positive outlook on open source and open collaboration, strategic for sort of geopolitical 
uh, uh, needs of, of, of the EU. Uh, on the other hand, when you see you know, laws like the CRA coming down with uh, sort of gray areas where potentially contributors, uh, uh, foundations, and package managers risk to be liable um, inadvertently, really, this actually risks uh, 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 you know, undermining the very open source innovation that the EU is really trying to drive. And so I think it, it comes down to education and it comes down to, I think, the LF has a really important role to play. You know, there's only so much you can do with abstract training, but bringing case studies and success stories and, and what we've been able to accomplish on a global scale in bringing together, you know, major projects like Kubernetes, Linux, things that the world run on uh, are going to be very, very useful, I think, uh, you know, not just for open source, but for the EU and their, and their broader goals that they, uh, you know, believe hinge on open source. Gabriele, thank you so much for taking time today and talk with me about the updates on LF Europe, and I would love to talk to you again soon. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're always uh, a great fun to chat with. Thank you.